Hey everyone, this is Nick and it's this time of the week again, the time where you only watch the first part of this Linux and open source news video. You know, the one that's on the thumbnail. Come on, you know you do it. I see you. But what you should do is watch the entire video because we have Deepin introducing a new packaging format that seems completely unnecessary. We have Gnome 43 introducing a new feature that seems kinda half-baked to the point that Ubuntu might consider not even shipping it. And we have the usual Gnome and KDE updates. We've got updates to Kden Life and a lot more. So come on, stick around. Don't just watch the deep end part. And also watch this segue to today's sponsor. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is my favorite solution to run a Linux or gaming server. It's what I use to run my own Nextcloud instance and my own only office server. The interface is super easy to use. They are affordable, they have tons of documentation online, and they have one-click deployable servers for a ton of applications or games. For example, Focal Board. If you don't know about it, it's an open source alternative to tools like Trello, Asana, or Notion. It lets you create milestones, keep track of your nodes, have a bird's eye view of your projects, and it basically helps you get stuff done. And you can deploy your Focal Board server in one click from your Linode dashboard, something I should probably do to ensure that I keep delivering my videos on time. And to get you started, Linode is giving you $100 of free credit to get your own Linux server or gaming server running. To get access to that, just click the link in the description below. So, you probably know about Deepin, the Chinese distribution, who also makes their own desktop environment and apps called Deepin DE. Well, it looks like the new version of Deepin, Deepin 23, will get a few interesting improvements, and one that I can't really get behind. On top of adding atomic updates that will prevent updating errors by only applying the updates if they actually complete and not package by package, and some updated internals, Deepin will start pushing a new packaging format called Linglong. They bill it as something that solves dependency hell, can be distributed online and offline, it's containerized, it's well integrated with the system, and you can start apps by just double-clicking them. They already built a dedicated web store with a few apps, and it doesn't seem like it's possible to build your own repos yet for that packaging format. There's already a command line backend that lets you list, install, uninstall, run, and update applications with a legible syntax, although app names will be the same as what Flatpak uses, apparently, so let's hope they have aliases so you don't have to type org.deepend.calculator if you want to install an app called Calculator. The graphical part will be handled through the Deepin store. So in substance, it's yet another packaging format that does nothing and solves nothing that Flatpak, Snaps or App Images don't already solve. So at best, it will stick to Deepin and no one else will adopt it. And at worst, it will be adopted by other distros and it will split our user base even more. So why Deepin decided not to contribute to an existing packaging format instead of creating their own? I have absolutely no idea, but yeah, that's one more standard, I guess. KDE developers have contributed a bunch of cool updates to their desktop environment this week. And the big one is a new selection mode in Dolphin. It lets you select multiple items and easily copy, cut, rename, trash, or open files with the single-click mode or with a touchscreen, and it looks pretty user-friendly. It's optional, and it can be entered by pressing the spacebar, or pressing and holding a file, or through a menu item. Now, on top of that, Elisa, the music player, got a full-screen mode, and the artist view displays a grid of the artist's albums instead of generic icons. The main menu and its alternative, kicker, as well as the overview, now lets you launch executable files instead of always trying to open them in an app. And the Get New Stuff windows now support animated GIFs as preview images, which will make it easier to preview new desktop effects. Of course, there are also a few important bug fixes, like alternatives to the main menu being able to search for files again, touch scrolling being restored in that menu, and Kirigami apps not freezing as much anymore. Pretty nice improvements, and that new selection mode will definitely come in handy for touchscreen users in combination with that new tablet mode that 5.25 introduced. Still in KDE land, the KDE Gear compilation 22.08 was released. The main changes to KDE apps are Kate and Kwrite getting multi-cursor support, 
Elisa, now supporting touch screens, Spectacle, the screenshot app, now displaying keyboard shortcuts, and resizing itself in annotation mode to have the full view of the capture to be able to annotate it better. Calendar now supports contacts, letting you add address books from various sources and being able to generate QR codes to share them, as well as bringing enhancements to the calendar view and letting you see subtasks and parent tasks in the task sidebar. KD Itinerary now has a barcode scanner to import paper tickets into the app and discount program cards. KWrite now supports tabs and screen splitting. Kate shows its toolbar by default and has a much improved menu bar layout. Dolphin now lets you sort files by file extension, and it also lets you remove items from the recent files and the recent locations list. These are updates that all KDE users should be looking forward to whatever their distro, and honestly, Calendar has improved so much and it's gotten so good that it's the app I use for Calendar and tasks on all my computers, even those that don't run KDE. GNOME developers also made some good progress this week. Newsflash, the RSS feed reader, got the ability to render latex math formulas inside of articles. Kuha, the screen recorder, got a 3 second delay option, improved the settings layout, and will now remember the previously selected video sources. Gradients, formerly known as Advita Manager, has improved performance. It fixes invisible text in cards, which is a bug that appeared when the material you like colors were applied, and the app also got some UI improvements. Black Box, a recent terminal emulator, now lets you search for text, customize the number of lines kept in the buffer, and they refine the UI and reduce the CPU usage. Bottles now lets you enable VM Touch to cache data and improve performance, and it also adds a new dialog to configure VK Basalt, as well as a dark mode switcher to force dark mode if your desktop environment doesn't support dark mode preference. The Add to Steam and Add Desktop entries now also work for integrations with Epic, Ubisoft, and other launchers. Nothing on the GNOME Shell side of things this time, but seeing these apps improving again and again and seeing bottles shine more and more is always welcome. Still on GNOME, the work to revamp the new file menu in Nautilus is ongoing, with the first prototypes being shared and reviewed. This process landed some new mockups, which seem like they'll work as follows. You click the new file item in the context menu of the file manager, and you get a dialog that lists all available templates from the templates folder and lets you immediately enter a file name. Default templates will also be offered, like a text file or office documents, if the user has the corresponding apps installed. If custom templates exist, a search field will also be present. Now, long term, the plan is also to offer the user the possibility to install apps that can handle these default template formats, like a text editor or an office suite, straight from the new file dialog, in case these are not already present. This all looks great and super user friendly, and it should make this kind of hidden feature a lot more prominent and a lot more usable for basically everyone. And if you want some more tips and tricks about GNOME, I made a specific video about all of this, so check it out up here or up there, I don't know, in the card in one of these corners. Caden Live 22.08 was released, and it's a big enough release that it deserves a spot in this news video. The update improves the proxy clip workflow, including NVENC or VA API, which should speed things up considerably. And rendering can now use parallel processing to be a lot speedier as well. Subtitles can now be styled with custom colors, fonts, outlines, and more. There are a bunch of new effects you can apply. The guides can now be exported as chapter description markers for YouTube, Peertube, or Vimeo, which will save a lot of time compared to writing down time codes when you're done creating your video. The audio recording interface got an overhaul, and the user interface has been revamped as well with a new improved clip tagging system that lets you add, edit, and reorder tags in the project bin. Now, there's still no GPU acceleration for previewing, but still, Kdenlive should now be a lot faster, at least for exporting, so all these improvements make Kdenlive into a way better video editor than it already was, which is awesome. And there's some new Linux hardware coming. First, the Tuxedo Infinity Book Pro 14, Generation 7. It brings a 3K display with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio and a giant 99 watt hour battery, coupled with a Core i7-12700H with 14 CPU cores. If you would prefer more storage instead, it's also possible to reduce the battery and have 4TB of RAID SSDs, 
while still keeping a 5 to 8 hours battery life. The chassis is magnesium and can come in silver or dark grey, and it embarks a huge touchpad and can even use an RTX 3050 Ti if you need GPU power. It also has Thunderbolt 4 on top of two USB-A, HDMI 2 and two USB-C ports that can charge the laptop. There's also the new iteration of the Starbook, Mark 6 this time, also with 12th gen Intel CPUs, but you can choose a Ryzen 7 instead. It's made out of aluminium, it has a 14-inch 1080p display, up to 14 hours of battery life, three USB-A, one USB-C, a micro SD slot and an HDMI port with a glass trackpad and a fingerprint reader. It also brings a much improved webcam at 1080p, better speakers and a better mic, which should fix all the issues I had with the previous model. Both look like great devices, with the Starbook being less expensive and the InfinityBook having a better display and a bigger battery. GNOME 43 will bring a new feature to its settings in the form of a device security page that will let you know about the security status of your laptop or desktop, including secure boot and a lot of other features. It seems that this new thing might not be completely thought out yet though, as some Ubuntu developers pointed out. The issue here is that there are four security levels from zero to three, the highest being three. But a default Ubuntu install will only net a security level of one. The new page doesn't explain how a user could improve their security level, which might lead to users either trying to increase it themselves and risking breaking their system, or it could lead to the user thinking Linux isn't a secure OS when it's generally on the OEM instead. Ubuntu might not ship that feature because of that, although it does raise the question, is it better to tell the user that stuff isn't as secure as it could be, at the risk of scaring them, or is it better to keep the information hidden but potentially exposing the user to risks if someone grabs their device. I personally think that this feature should be shipped. If you ship GNOME 43, you should ship this feature as well. It's better for the user to know if their device is vulnerable, even though you might not like that they know that, they need to know. Future iterations though, like immediately afterwards, should bring guides to let the user know how they can improve that security level. And let's finish this video with some gaming news. First, Proton Experimental has a new release, which makes a lot of games playable, like Outriders, Warhammer Vermintide 2, and more. It also fixes ray tracing in Crisis Remastered and a bunch of other issues, so it's already available in Steam if you want to try it out. Next, we have CMU 2.0 being released, and this Wii U emulator is now officially open source and supports Linux. For now, there's only an Ubuntu package, but the developers are looking at Flatpak and app images to make it easier to install on other distros. It's great news for people who want to play the few exclusive Wii U titles there are. And finally, we have a new SteamOS update. It fixes an issue that caused random stutters, and another one that caused performance drops when a UI element appeared on screen with the performance HUD enabled. There's also a new beta coming, version 3.4, which will update the Arch base of SteamOS, hopefully also updating the desktop mode to a newer Plasma release and its corresponding apps. I will personally be leaving my Steam Deck alone for quite a few months because Immortal Empires just dropped for Warhammer Total War 3 and I'm going to play that exclusively for a long, long while, while I pine for a Warhammer 40k Total War game. Come on, just make it, you know people will buy that just like you should buy a device from today's sponsor. Tuxedo is a company based in Germany and they make laptops and desktops that run Linux out of the box. They ship worldwide, they have all keyboard layouts and they have models for every price point and every need, whether you need a small, less expensive little laptop or a super powerful workstation desktop PC, you can have it all. And you can configure every device with a ton of options for CPU, GPU, RAM, SSDs, additional drives, additional Blu-ray drives, you can even get your own logo or graphics design engraved on the lid of your laptop, which I did with my Stellaris 15, which is the laptop I use to edit all my videos. Why should you buy from Tuxedo? Well, because they're a manufacturer that supports Linux. They help contribute to make this hardware supported by Linux and they provide everything you need so that their devices run Linux perfectly out of the box. So if you're interested and you want to support Linux development and you want to make sure that your new device runs Linux perfectly,
head over to the link in the description below, click it and get yourself a new tuxedo device. So thanks everyone for watching the video. If you liked it, you know what you have to do. Don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment, whatever, to make this video more popular. And if you didn't like the video, well, dislike it and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you want to support the channel and help me make more of these videos, you can also join my Patreon subscribers or my YouTube members. Both get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. Or you can also just click the super thanks button or the PayPal link in the description. So thanks everyone for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.